All right. If you couldn't tell from my Instagram feed these last couple of weeks, we are reviewing one of my all time, very favorite ever cameras from 2003. And that would be the Olympus E1 DSLR. Open your eyes, what can you see around? Wind of the open sky, over the siren sound. This is a dream, getting the royal scar, holding a diamond blade, throwing it far. Holding your breath still, you jump the fire. 2003 5 megapixels but what makes it one of my very favorite cameras of all time is that it does have the and i am not going to remember this so i'm going to read it off the paper a kodak kaf 5101c ccd sensor there are very few cameras that had this type of sensor this is a four thirds version of it so it is a smaller sensor other cameras include the E300 from Olympus, the E500 from Olympus, the very rare E400 from Olympus. And then from there on out, it started to go into live MOS uh, sensors. So away from CCD, another classic and remarkable camera with the same Kodak formula in a different size, an APS-H size, if I recall correctly is the Leica M8. Uh, so what this sensor is known for is its color rendition. And it is hard to articulate what makes this so distinct, but arguments be what they may on the internet as to whether there is any merit to the CCD sensor. I just love the way the colors come out. Just sight unseen, untouched, no post, the JPEGs are incredible. Uh, the RAW files are incredible. And that gets right into one of my favorite elements of this camera. Despite being from 2003, you can shoot RAW and JPEG on this camera. And that's actually pretty rare for this era. You kind of had to choose between RAW and JPEG if it even had a RAW functionality. So this was the first serious pro DSLR that Olympus ever created. It feels very robust, very strong, like it's gonna be able to take a pretty serious beating. And that's why when you find them these days, they're oftentimes still in really good shape. Uh, this one is pretty much untouched. I mean, it's kind of shocking how little use it shows. And the, the body itself has all the buttons that you could ever want. So it has your standard mode dials up here, P, A, S, and M. Uh, it has a white balance button, so you can select your white balance button and dial in your white balance. It has what Olympus has really made famous is one touch white balance. So if you find a white wall like here, and I just hit this button up front, this little white balance button, it's a one touch white balance that will just balance off of that wall and I've dialed into the custom function. It's really fast and it's really nice. One of the other things about this camera, which is kind of remarkable, particularly for its age, is the auto white balance is fantastic. Like that is actually one of my biggest issues with these older cameras is the white balance can be really off. This particular body has a separate white balance sensor in that is not through the lens. So it's actually on the body. I can't even remember where it is. It might be one of the IR like rays here, but it has a separate uh, white balance specific meter and it really does a fantastic job of reading the scene properly. It has continuous single point and manual autofocus dialed in by a switch here, which is really nice. I will say sometimes that gets knocked and you just wanna watch out for that. Sometimes I've pulled it out of my bag and it's in continuous or manual and I didn't notice it right away. So kind of a pro and a con but I do like having a physical switch. It has a, you know, a socket here if you wanna, I'm not gonna try to open this, but it has sockets here for you know, sync flash um, 
and uh, like a uh, remote trigger. And up here you have a button for your metering styles. It has a super basic, very simple menu. Menu. Um, and the first thing you're offered in the menu is card setup so you can format your CF card. This does take CF card memory. It does not have an option for SD or any other type. And usually you have to dig deep into a menu to find the format, which I find so clunky. First thing offered in the menu, fantastic. I love that. It has exposure compensation here on the top. It has a really nice dial up here. It has a dial back here. So if you're shooting in manual, aperture and shutter are right here on the top and on the back, just a really classic DSR, DSLR feel. And in here it has a bunch of ports for things that I don't use. Uh, if you wanted to show your pictures on a TV, how quaint and old school. And then there is a light on the top. So if you're shooting in the dark and you wanna light up your top display, you can do that. Other great things about this camera, the battery life is fantastic. These are older batteries, but they are very easily found still. Uh, they look like this. And it's uh, Olympus BLM-1. These I think are like in the Canon 5D. Like these are very common batteries, easily found and bought fresh on Amazon, which I would recommend because these older batteries don't usually uh, retain a great deal of life after 20 years or whatever it's been. Uh, so buy a fresh set. The other thing that's pretty impressive for this camera, so it writes to CF cards. The write time is slow, but you have a really decent buffer. You have a 12 frame buffer. So let me just show you what that looks like. I am gonna shoot multiple photos of the camera. And now we're locked up. So you got 12 frames to capture, then you're gonna get this little right uh, light here. This is now writing to the card. That will take a minute. So it's kind of, for me, the best of both worlds because I've had other cameras where the buffer is so small that I can only capture a certain number of pictures and then it's actually writing on top of that. So it takes a really long time. I still go out and shoot my family or action or soccer or whatever and I feel pretty confident that I'm gonna get the shot I need just knowing after I've shot my spray of images, I will need a minute to let the camera catch up. It has auto ISO, and I don't know if this was changed with a firmware update, but from what I understand, the auto ISO is kind of strange because it, it locks it at, auto, at ISO 100 no matter how low the light gets until you put on a flash and then it will extend it up to ISO 800. Natively, this goes from ISO 100 to 800 and then it stretches in boost mode to like 3200. I never shoot this camera above ISO 400. These are not files that are read by DxO, which has a fantastic noise reduction feature in terms of software. I am processing these files in Lightroom or Capture One. Capture One does naturally sharpen the files much more so they have more detail, but you can just do that in Lightroom um, just manually, but you are gonna have noise above, really above 200. 400 starts to see noise and then above that gets pretty noisy. If you don't mind or if you wanna just convert it to black and white, not an issue, I just haven't found the need. Another thing that I really like about this camera is that it can be very, very manual. I mean, obviously it's a pro camera and it has things like weather sealing and things like that. So it's really built with a pro in mind. You can dial everything in manually. And normally for this age camera, I would always recommend you do everything manual. But this camera does shockingly well in program mode. All of these JPEGs are in program mode with auto white balance straight out of camera with slight tweaks in the menus, which I will capture in the show notes down below. Um, for my JPEG settings, but I could not be happier with the just right out of camera output of this particular body. The other funny thing that you can do is if you are shooting in RAW or RAW plus JPEG, you can in the menu go in and reprocess or process your 
raw image in the camera body, very similar to the way like Fuji's work now, where like you capture an image, you can go back, change the film simulation or what have you. You can actually do that in body in this Olympus E1, which I was really surprised by. I was like, really? You can? I found that like stumbling through the manual. The viewfinder in this is really nice. It is basically 100% magnification. So you're really seeing what you're gonna get. Uh, it is a little challenging. I have an adapter where I put some of my, uh, my manual focus SLR glass. However, the focusing is a little tricky. Thanks to one of my viewers, I was informed of a split magnifying glass or not uh, a split viewfinder, you know, basically a focusing screen that you put in the body with a split prism so that you can align your top and bottom frame to see when you're actually in focus. So that's in the mail. I'm really excited to put that in this body and really start to use more of those manual lenses because I have been using more of my autofocus lenses just based on that not feeling 100% confident in my ability to manual focus. There is a cleaning mode in here and it has built-in dust shake. I think that's what they call it. And this is something Olympus even to this day is really well known for, but it started off early, early. And uh, I remember seeing some review online about this camera. They've never experienced any sensor dust because it has this built-in shake and it seems super effective. I've never had any issues with dust and I have two of these bodies. I have multiple other Olympus DSLR bodies and yeah, dust has not been an issue as a result of that shake feature. So it like shifts the sensor when you turn it off and keeps dust from clinging to it, which is super awesome. Some of the negatives about this camera, uh, and there are a few for sure. So it's a physically large camera. This could be a pro or a con. I actually really like it because like I said, it's kind of beefy and the selling point of Micro Four Thirds as a system is that it's small everything, right, in theory. But these early DSLRs and obviously some of the new ones, the OM-1, for example, they're bigger bodies, but they also have small lenses. So this is a 25 millimeter F 2.8 pancake lens. I love this lens, highly recommend it. It is such a great everyday shooter, not terribly expensive, at least, you know, if you look around and you're patient. It is obviously on the body itself, pretty small, but it's, it's truly a pancake. And this is great for the E1, but also the E300 or the E420 if you are going with a live moss sensor or something like that. But they do get big. And now let's just talk about some of these lenses because they get heavy and that could be a con. So this would be my biggest lens. This guy is massive. Uh, when I say massive though, you know, compared to a full frame body, it's not massive. It is a 14 to 35 millimeter F2 lens. It is optically just beautiful. I just think it's such a beautiful lens. This is a pricey lens, and I don't know if I would recommend it unless you're really committed to this system and you find one used for a good price. So there were three lines of lenses. There was the Ultra Pro, which is this SWD model, 14 to 35. They also had a 35 to 100 F2 SWD. SWD is super wave motor or something like, or drive. It just means it autofocuses a lot better which I have comments about, but that 35 to 100 is supposed to be spectacular. I will never buy that lens. I don't usually shoot a lot of telephoto and it is a very heavy lens, even more heavy than this one. This is a heavy lens, but on a big body like this, it does not bother me one bit. I carry this thing as a daily carry all the time. I love it. I will not part with either of these items ever. This 14 to 54 is their midline, so it's still like above the kit lens. It's a fabulous lens. This is definitely like, if I wanted a more lightweight daily driver, I would use this one, but I would also be super happy with the really, really entry level 14 to 45. Where did I put that? Here. This entry level 14 to 45, it's a slower lens. So this is 3.5 to 5.6. The 14 to 54 
is 2.8 to 3.5, so it does let in a little bit more light. This lets in a little less light, has a little less reach, but it's and it's super plasticky, but the upside of that is it's super lightweight. This is definitely feels sturdier. And then at the pro, pro level, you have the F2, heavy, super solid construction, lots of glass elements, but these two are sharp as H. Like, I don't know if I'm allowed to say how long, <laughs> whatever. There are other fantastic lenses for it. The Olympus 40 to 150 is my basic telephoto. This one is also a kit lens. It is plasticky, it is cheap. I mean, it's like $30 or something. It's super cheap and it's a good performer. I mean, it's not the best, but it's 100% all that I will ever need in this range because I don't shoot a lot of birds or wildlife. It's just something I like to carry with me in the event that I come across a scene that I want a little bit more reach for. This is actually my favorite lens. This is the 50 millimeter prime F2 macro lens. This is one of the most delicious lenses to put on this system. It is stunningly sharp. It has phenomenal fall off. It's macro you can get in a 35 millimeter equivalent one to one. It's actually two one or one two or whatever that, you know, but when you do the equivalent on 35 millimeter, it is one to one. It is just a stellar, stellar performer. I think probably the best lens they ever made for the system. Thank you to uh, Snappiness on YouTube for actually DMing me this listing on eBay. I appreciate you so much because I have loved this lens and I would not part with this. There are other lenses from other manufacturers. I mean other, there's one other manufacturer and that would be Panasonic who was also in the four thirds system before it became the micro four thirds system. If you wanna buy any of these lenses, make sure you're looking for the original four thirds mount, not the micro four thirds mount. Micro four, more, ugh. Micro four thirds will not work on this body. This is a much larger diaphragm. Um, so you just wanna keep an eye out for that. But this Lumix Panasonic 25 millimeter 1.4, a spectacular lens. I love this lens. One thing to note though, is that the autofocus does not play particularly nice cross brand. So these Panasonic lenses, I also have, oh, it's not here. I'll grab it. But I also have the Panasonic 14 millimeter to 150 millimeter Leica lens, which is just a fantastic travel lens. I use that, like if I have to go traveling with this body, my choice would probably be either the 14 to 150 for the reach and a fast prime like the 25 millimeter or the 50 millimeter F2 or the 14 to 35 millimeter and the 50 millimeter F2. One of the things I will say though, that I discovered late because I got this lens, the 14 to 35, and I was really frustrated because it was having a really hard time focusing. And I was like, this is an Olympus lens. Why is it taking so long for it to autofocus? One trick. So in the menu, if you go to the first wrench, so this wrench up here, and you go down to release priority S. So that's gonna be shutter release priority. And you turn that on, this thing moves so much faster. It actually fixed almost all of the autofocus issues that I was experiencing. It was just hunting too much for autofocus and really hesitating. It's not still going to be the fastest autofocus and this gets into another con. There are only three autofocus points. So this is definitely a camera that I shoot in a single point center autofocus and recompose. So I do half press for locking my uh, focus and the AEL for locking my exposure and that's how I'm shooting this camera. Um, okay, so stating the obvious, one of the other cons will be the five megapixel resolution, which for social media or whatnot, you're not gonna have an issue. And frankly, in the era of software that we live in, you can in Lightroom or you know, there are a million softwares where you can upscale images now and it really does a phenomenal job without artifacting or like crazy edge, crazy pixel edges. Uh, so I feel so totally okay with five megapixels, but if you do a lot of cropping or you're looking to really print, you know, huge, that's gonna be an issue. This has no image stabilization. 
and these lenses do not have image stabilization. So you just want to keep that in mind as you are shooting that, you know, if you're used to being able to shoot a two second exposure handheld, that's not going to happen. There is no built in flash on the top. So you do have the option to add an external flash, but it's not like the E300, which the, just has a pop-up flash or whatever. That's, I actually do kind of wish this had a pop-up flash. I know that's like not pro, but I love having that. One of the other cons is just the lens lineup is more limited. This system, this original four third system was only in circulation a short period of time. So there are only a certain number of lenses developed and there aren't a lot of wide angle options. There is like, I think there's a seven to 14, which would be the widest and that's a zoom. There is kind of a gimmicky uh, eight millimeter fisheye lens. And then there's a 11 to 22, which in full frame equivalent would be a field of view of 22 to 44 millimeters. So if you're a super wide angle fan, this might be a bit more of a limited system for you. And then the last con that I will say is that this shutter speed goes up to one four thousandth of a second. I do wish it went up to one eight thousandth of a second, which I believe the E3 and E5 that came after this do. However, they both moved to a live MOS sensor, so they are not CCD. And that is why I have not upgraded and I will not be upgrading because this E1 is again, one of my favorite all time cameras and just, something I cherish and use very frequently. So wonderful camera, can't recommend it highly enough. As you can tell, I feel very strongly about this one and I'm so happy to have discovered it and to own it. Normally, this is the point at which I would draw my next camera for the next two weeks. However, I'm taking a little trip to meet up with one of my dearest and oldest camera friends. If you don't follow her, you should. Her name is Beacon Film Photo on Instagram. She also runs Mamiya 7 Ruined Everything, which is a fantastic site if you love Mamiya 7s or film photography in general. And I'll be taking my own selection of cameras. There will be more than one, definitely two, possibly three. I might post a few photos, but I may go dark for a little bit while I shoot those cameras and then unveil what I have selected to take with me. In the meantime, follow me on Instagram at one month, two cameras. If you want to see some of those sample images that may be coming down the pike for the next camera to be reviewed. And I will see you in two weeks. Thanks so much for watching. Bye.